Good morning and welcome to Ask the Expert. I'm Joe Taylor. This morning, another in the ongoing series of programs presented by the Northwest Regional Key Program for Quality Early Learning. The program, through the Northwest Institute of Research, oversees a grant from the Office of Child Development and Early Learning at the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services and the Department of Education. The goal of the program is to improve the outcomes for young children as they prepare for school. John Polza from the Pennsylvania Key is the host of the program and is with us throughout the series. And who is with us uh, this morning on the show, John? Good morning, Joe. This morning we have Dr. Ashley Sullivan, a professor of early childhood education at Penn State Erie's Barron campus. Dr. Sullivan's research specializes on social justice and equity as it relates to working with LGBT children. Dr. Sullivan is included in the 2017 edition of the Top 40 Professionals in the Erie Area, having an impact under the age of 40. Welcome to the program, Dr. Sullivan. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. So good to have you. Um, you know, I found the research you're doing just so very, very interesting and uh, so timely in terms of um, our society today. And the first thing, obviously, that I want to ask you is, as an early childhood education professor, which we've had many on the program, how did you initially become interested in doing research involving one of your specialties is involving research on transgender children? That's a really interesting question. So it actually started um, quite a long time ago, about two decades ago or so now, uh, when I was an undergrad. And I started off in the field of social work. And I stumbled upon a documentary um, I think it came out in 2000. It was called, Is it a Boy or a Girl? And it was about intersex children. Uh, in particular, it talked about the problem regarding operating on very young intersex children, sometimes newborns, obviously without their consent, and the repercussions of that, long-term, lifelong repercussions of that. And so very often these children are um, surgically altered to be what, sort of society deems uh, to be looking like a girl, right? Because that right. surgery is easier to perform. And um, as a result, sometimes, you know, the doctors are wrong. And these very young children um, can be sterilized, uh, at a, you know, against their consent. And so I was horrified by that. And it really sort of sparked my interest in advocacy uh, for children that sort of fall outside uh, that male-female binary. And that's how I became interested in uh, learning as much as I could about trans kids and um, how I could advocate for, for trans kids and intersex kids as well. Well, that's just amazing hearing that. Um, and I just, you know, I think most people hearing that for the first time would be quite shocked to know that that even takes place. Is it more prevalent than we, we really know? It happens more often than not, um, and it's still happening every day today in this country, unfortunately. A lot of doctors are sort of old school in the way they think about things and guide parents toward that direction. Of course, not everyone is doing that, and things are changing, um, but unfortunately, 17 years after that documentary, that's still happening. Is this a situation where the child has both male and female genitalia? Correct. So they have some kind of typically genetic condition, um, and that can manifest itself in, in many different ways because there are many, many different ways to be intersex. And so it's, it's a situation where, you know, a child may be born and the parents say, what is it? And the doctors say, I don't know. Um, right, because we, we are identifying children as it before we, we give them a gender, right. which is incredibly problematic. Yes, yes. You know, diversity, social justice, equity, and probably most important, acceptance are all terms we hear regarding how we as a society should approach the issue of transgender identification in children. What does your research tell us as to how we either are or are not applying these principles? Well, the word, the word that really jumps out at me in that question is the word acceptance. And I, I really struggle with that term as actually being problematic because when I think of, of terms like acceptance and tolerance, I, I envision it ex 
accepting someone or tolerating someone. And I think we're sort of at a crisis in our country right now regarding trans kids, and we need to really do a better job than just accepting them. Um, I don't know if you know this, but 46% of trans men and 42% of trans women attempt suicide. So that's nearly half. And um, those rates are higher among young people, among people of color, and people who have a household income that's less than $10,000. Um, trans women in particular of color are at a greater risk of violence. And um, transgender people are four times as likely to have a household income under $10,000 and twice as likely to be unemployed as a cisgender person in the United States. And this comes from the, uh, the National Transgender Discrimination Survey. I'd like and to, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, you go on. You go on. Please. I really feel like we need to move to a place of advocacy and activism to sit to inclusion and full, full um, incorporation of trans people into all facets of society. Now, I do think that we have a greater representation of trans people sort of across the board. And this has happened in the mass media quite recently. I would say in the past 10 years, we all of a sudden have, for the very first time, representations of transgender characters, for example, in, in uh, popular television shows. So in Glee and The Fosters, and we have Transparent, we have I Am Jazz, a variety of other shows where we have transgender people who are represented. And so I do think that there is a greater understanding of trans people, which is really important, and increased visibility. However, I also think that as a result of that, there's sort of this whitewashing over of what it means to be trans. So, um, for example, in a lot of these cases, a, a, the character will come out on TV, and they will come out as trans. They'll be accepted by some people and rejected by other people. They'll then go to the doctor, who will give them permission to transition. They'll start hormones. Um, they'll change their hair, their pronouns, uh, their dress, interests, and the like, and potentially have surgery. And then on the other side of that, they, quote, unquote, pass as, a, as being essentially a cisgender person. And so that storyline, that narrative, works for some people and re reflects the true lives of some people, but not others. And so... We've identified this sort of phenomenon as the hegemony of transition in, in our research in an article that we have coming out, the sort of expectation that all people will follow this path. And this is particularly dangerous for trans kids because a lot of trans kids now are identifying as non-binary or gender queer, gender expansive, gender creative, and not necessarily transgender. And so it's important that they're lives and experiences are represented too. And I want to go back to the part about passing. So to pass means basically to exist in society in a way that no one questions your gender identity, right? Right. That's really problematic for a lot of reasons because you're just sort of conforming to the norm or the expectation is that you would conform to the norm, that no one would look at or question you when you're walking through the grocery store. Well, some kids don't want to pass because that's not their goal. That's not how they see themselves reflected. There are kids that um, identify as non-binary, and that means that they uh, identify as both male and female. Sometimes, you know, it, it changes based on the day, whether they feel more male or more female. Some kids can't pass for a variety of reasons. So, for example, uh, they don't have supportive parents. And if you're a trans kid in this country and you don't have supportive parents and you don't get access to the medical treatment that you need early on, you can go through secondary puberty. And once you go through secondary puberty, you have characteristics that are either irreversible or very difficult and costly and painful to reverse or change. And so um, a lot of trans people, as I mentioned, live in poverty. And this is because it's harder to get a job when you, quote, unquote, don't pass. It's harder to have access to housing and education, um, especially when you're facing harassment, bullying, those kinds of things. And so the sort of expectation that all trans people should pass, and you look at Caitlyn Jenner, who has, you know, virtually unlimited resources, right. or, or someone like Je 
Jazz Jennings, who who has really done a lot for the trans youth community, but was able, because of supportive parents, to transition early, um, they, those people have a very kind of different experience, you know, or Laverne Cox, who who's an incredible advocate um, for the trans community. Um, but again, she has access to lots of resources that many trans people don't have. So, um, yes, I think it's important that we come from a place of ac- advocacy and activism for our youngest trans kids, um, and we need to trust kids, too. We need to trust them when they tell us that they're trans. So um, gender identity develops between, typically between the ages of two and four for all children, including trans children. And that's the time when kids will start to let you know. Of course, this isn't true for everyone, but this is a time when a lot of kids will start to tell you who they are, and we need to just believe that. So I'd like to go back, if I can, to, and I think maybe you're answering at the very end of what you were just saying, <clears throat> the question that I have, <clears throat> pardon me, going back to the operation uh, in, in infancy, if the operation is not performed in infancy, when is it decided, when does that child decide their gender and proceed from, from that point? Or is that what you just said at the very end of what you, what you concluded a few seconds ago? Well, that's different. I think for intersex children, it can be different than transgender children. And there are a variety of issues that are compounded with intersex children um, related to genetics and hormones. Sometimes puberty changes things um, in addition to what actually has been disclosed to an intersex child about their anatomy or about their genetics or their history sometimes doesn't happen with intersex children. And so I think it's very much a case-by-case basis with with intersex kids sometimes. Although, again, whether it's an intersex child or a trans child, we should listen to them when they tell us who they are. Um, with, with trans children, it, it, again, it depends on the individual person. So it's really hard to sort of give a blanket statement. But what we do know is that puberty blockers are incredible. So if a child's gender identity does not match the gender they were assigned at birth, um, so for example, the doctor looks at your external genitalia and assigns you as a a girl or a boy, but your identity does not match that, um, puberty blockers are fantastic because there are are very few long-term consequences to using them. They're easily reversible, and it gives kids a little bit of extra time before they actually have to take hormones. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah. We're talking with Dr. Ashley Sullivan, professor of early childhood education at Penn State. Uh, Dr. Sullivan's research specializes on social justice and equity as it relates to working with transgender and LGBT children in general. Uh, LGBT children, and particularly transgender children, Uh, often struggle with depression, as we know, and some with cases much more severe than others. You quoted the statistics for the transgender population. This can resolve in thoughts or attempts by these children to take their own life. And what can we learn and do as a society to try to prevent this from happening? I think it's most important to note that trans kids are not inherently mentally ill. That many of them face mental health issues, but those are not a direct result of biology. Those are a result of the way society has treated them. So when you have a continuous rejection, discrimination, harassment, violence, or persistent fear of violence, pressure to conform, that can cause mental illness. So mental illness, very often for trans kids, is a symptom of a greater issue and not the cause. So I think it's really important first and foremost to, and I'll always go back to this, to support trans kids, to accept, respect, and include their voices. So we're, 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 ha- we're bringing trans kids to the table, and we're accepting and respecting them for who they are and creating environments, particularly in school, where they feel safe, where they feel included and wanted and supported. Uh, we also really need to understand mental health and reduce the stigma around mental health issues. 
And we need to stop classifying transgender people in the mental health realm. So to this day, um, trans people need to have a mental health diagnosis, which is gender dysphoria. It comes from the DSM-5 in order to receive treatment, which often is you know, hormones and surgery. And I can't think of any other capacity in which we require a mental health diagnosis for a medical intervention. Right. So it would be nice to, to step out of that sort of way of classifying um, trans people. We also really need to remove barriers for treatment. So depression and anxiety are hard enough, uh, but we need to stop making ki- trans kids feel like they're broken there's something wrong with them. It's not the kids who are broken. It's the adults around them that are broken. It's the system that is broken. Again, uh, going back to that word, acceptance. Acceptance by society is so, so important. You know, I know you're very close to releasing your book. And um, I know that uh, when we talked a little earlier that you didn't want to get into too much detail regarding it. But it's going to be titled Voices of Transgender Children in Early Childhood Education. Reflections on Resistance and Resiliency. Now, I find the terms resistance and resiliency you use in the title quite interesting because it kind of reminds me so much of how bullying and being bullied can have a major impact on children in school. So with children that are transgender often being the victims of bullying, what have you learned in your research that separates those transgender children able to resist and overcome this bullying and those that cannot? So it's interesting. As part of my dissertation, I interviewed transgender adults about what their early childhood education experiences were like. And so um, everyone talked about bullying. And uh, some of the things that they said helped them sort of to resist or push back against that to, to protect themselves um, were the most prominently support from peers and adults. So when they felt that there were supportive friends in their lives and supportive trusted teachers at school or a parent that advocated for them, they were able to navigate those tricky waters um, much better than, than kids that didn't have that level of support. What was also interesting that came out of the research were some strategies for trying to mitigate these situations. And uh, it was different depending on the the child. So uh, some people talked about having proximity to the teacher. So if they knew they had a supportive adult, they would try to sort of be near that adult um, in order to protect themselves. One of the people I interviewed was an artist. And that person would frequently draw pictures for the other children. And, you know, as, as a way of sort of having this skill that made them stand out and be special and, and reduce bullying. Um, a lot of the, the people who were involved in, in music or art in some capacity re- spoke very, very highly of those experiences. And those teachers, according to the, the people I interviewed, tended to be sort of more open-minded and supportive. Right. And those were places that they felt more safe. Uh, there, there were kids that acted out physically because the bullying had become so intense um, and they just couldn't be a target anymore. And so they asserted themselves physically um, so that the other children would feel less inclined to target them. Several of the people I interviewed talked about attempts to conform so to reduce bullying. So, for example... Uh, they were tired of being picked on, and so they would look at how the other um, girls in the room sat or um, the other way that the interests that they had, the way they talk, the way they walk, and try to mimic those kinds of things, which if you think about what that must be like for a young trans child um, and how, how stifling that must be to try to pretend that you're someone that you're not, but just for, for the act of self-preservation, And uh, there was someone else who talked about hiding and how uh, they would find safe places to kind of hide where the other children wouldn't find them. So, for example, this one person uh, would go into the coat closet with his G.I. Joes and play there where no one would would find him or tease him. So those were some of the strategies that uh, the people that I interviewed used to sort of navigate through um, the bullying situation. But... uh, 
I, I think that the thing that stands out the most really is supportive peers and adults. Right. And, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you this question before our time's up. Um, there are many issues relating to transgender children, of course, in school that school teachers, administrators, and all school staff, for that matter, may not be aware of in accommodating these children while in school. And the one we hear about most often is what restrooms they should be permitted to use while in school. Now, according to the Pennsylvania School Board Association, state courts have actually ruled on both sides of this issue. One case deciding that children can only use the restroom of the sex they were born with, while another ruling was that they can use the one they identify with. What advice can you lend to schools currently dealing with this issue? Well, first and foremost, trans kids need to feel safe at school. Trans kids need to be able to use, if you have sex-separated facilities or activities, they need to be able to, to use or engage in the ones that align with their gender identity. Um, if, if you have kids that feel uncomfortable with that, uh, cisgender children who feel uncomfortable for that, we can provide segregated facilities for those children um, because there's a distinct difference between being unsafe and being uncomfortable. And for someone whose external uh, gender expression is female, to walk into a, a male locker room is inherently unsafe. Um, but if there is a cisgender child whose parents feel that they are uncomfortable using that bathroom, then that child should have access to the nurse's room uh, or a teacher's lounge, those kinds of things. We need to, especially in early childhood, eliminate gender segregation to the greatest extent possible. Eliminate this idea of boys and girls lines, of um, having a housekeeping center that's for girls and sort of a block center that is traditionally known as being for boys, having goodie bags that are segregated for girls and boys. Even something that seems so as innocuous as addressing students as good morning boys and girls, we really need to get away from that. There was an interesting study that showed that uh, the teachers that more often, even inadvertently, use that kind of language um, had more issues with children that were using the same kind of language that were segregating based on gender as well. We need to use chosen names and pronouns um, at all times in face-to-face -face communications and also on forms. And we need to make sure that, that all of our bases are covered, uh, that not, not just that I'm identifying you as the name and pronoun that's appropriate for you, but, but also if I'm out of the classroom because I have an emergency and there's a substitute teacher, they're not just going to read the incorrect name um, from a roll call, and then all of a sudden now you're outed to everyone else. We need to maintain confidentiality. We need to have very strong non-discrimination policies uh, that include gender identity, and we need to make sure that um, we sort of, to the greatest extent possible, eliminate zero-tolerance policies because a lot of times those actually target trans kids. A trans child that's bullied for years may lash out aggressively, and then all of a sudden, you know, that child is expelled. Instead, um, restorative justice kinds of intervention programs right. are better. Um, it's also helpful to have a gender transition plan document uh, that can be filled out in conjunction with the family and the school uh, that can help that child feel supported through their transition process. Well, that is very enlightening. And our, our, our time is up, Dr. Sullivan, and, and it's been so enlightening. Um, Dr. Ashley Sullivan, professor of early childhood education at Penn State's Erie Barron campus. Dr. Sullivan's research specializes on social justice and equity as it relates to working with transgender children. She has a soon-to-be-released book, Voices of Transgender Children in Early Childhood Education, Reflections on Resistance and Resiliency. Thanks so much for being on our program, Dr. Sullivan. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And that's our program for today. We'll be back in two weeks at this same time. In the meantime, you can go online to learn more at papromiseforchildren.com. For John Poza and the Northwest Regional Key Program for Quality Early Learning, I'm Joe Taylor. Thank you for listening, and have a great day.